those I haven't met, I'm Ben Wellborn. I'm on the second year residence here. So this morning for my grand rounds, I'll be talking about uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty and specifically uh, expanding roles and indications for uh, reverse TSA. I chose this topic uh, because I feel like the fre frequency in which we as residents are uh, encountering reverse TSAs in both uh, testing and clinical scenarios quickly increasing. And I thought it would be beneficial for me to research this and learn more about this as it continues to uh, exponentially grow in use in the United States. So unfortunately, I have no financial disclosures uh, at this time or any affiliations with anyone in this study. So briefly, I will uh, try to quickly review the history of reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, and specifically the development in the hopes that it may provide some insight into why reverse TSA has just now been approved in the U.S. in the past 15 years and how this has uh, impacted prosthesis development. I'll discuss the biomechanics in hopes that uh, it'll specifically give some insight into current complications and uh, resultant debates in reverse TSA design. And then I'll ch change gears and talk about some expanding indications, specifically proximal humerus fractures in uh, elderly patients, massive rotator cuff tear in the absence of uh, shoulder arthritis, and, and patients under the age of 65. I realize there are several other indications for which reverse TSA is now used in the United States, but I'll try to stick to these three in the uh, essence of time. Uh, I think this is a pretty big topic in itself. So uh, reverse total shoulder arthroplasty was introduced in the 1970s. Uh, in an attempt to uh, restore function and relieve pain in uh, arthritic pseudoparalytic cuff deficient shoulders. Uh, these designs all utilized a quote lateralized center of rotation that really attempted to restore the native anatomy of a shoulder and specifically uh, the native cin uh, center of rotation. Uh, excuse me. So uh, Charles Neer, who's the father, uh, but considered by many to be the father of modern day shoulder arthroplasty actually developed several uh, reverse shoulder prosthesis. This one in the upper left is his first design, the Mark I, which is a highly constrained uh, reverse shoulder that was actually designed after uh, total hip arthroplasties. Uh, the goal of this was to, as I mentioned, to try to restore native anatomy and help create a fulcrum which the shoulder can operate without an intact rotator cuff. This was a large failure due to uh, shear forces at the glen uh, glenoid bony interface and uh, ultimately was never widely implemented. This bottom right was his last design, which uh, failed for similar reasons. Uh, and so uh, due to these failures, Near abandoned his designs and focused on hemiarthroplasty and anatomic total shoulders, which is quite successful. Uh, despite his failures, many others attempted to uh, design other reverse shoulder arthroplasty uh, prosthet prosthetics, and they were all ultimately failures for the same reason. They all had significant shear forces at the uh, glenoid component bony interface due to an attempt to restore the native uh, anatomy and center of rotation. So that was uh, through the 70s and early 80s. They also attempted several anatomic constraint designs such as these. I just thought these were interesting. Uh, they were highly cemented humeral components with heavily constrained glenoid components. They all failed for the same reasons. Uh, significant shear forces and torque at the <coughs> glenoid bony interface and ultimate failure. That was up until the mid 80s when Gramet in Europe uh, designed the first successful reverse shoulder arthroplasty. This was his first design on the left, a simple polyethylene liner cemented in a proximal humerus with a two thirds hemisphere uh, metal glenosphere component. Uh, this was really a revolutionary idea in arthroplasty in general as well as shoulder arthroplasty and it really represented a shift in thinking in that instead of trying to restore native anatomy, uh, Gramet decided that he was going to purposely alter the shoulder's anatomy in an attempt to use the remaining muscle uh, forces to restore abduction and shoulder flexion. This is on the bottom right was his uh, third and really most successful design, the Delta III, which was introduced in Europe in 1991 and was really the first success, long-term successful shoulder prosthesis. So uh, Gramet's design uh, was based off of four basic principles, which really served as the cornerstone on which modern reverse shoulder arthroplasty was built. Uh, while these principles are being modified today in arthroplasty design, they still hold true and really guide uh, current implant design. 
So Graham's first principle, uh, which was really critical in altering the thought process of arthroplasty was that the center of rotation must be fixed, distalized, and most importantly, medialized to the level of the glenoid surface. And so this acts to decrease that uh, lever arm and ultimately eliminated the lever arm that uh, acted to create shear forces at the uh, glenosphere and bony interface. So you can see here in this repre uh, representation that the lever arm here on the right, uh, denoted by this red line, uh, is acting as a shear force uh, on uh, a lateralized prosthesis, and uh, the force vector of the FS, or shear forces, compared to the FC, the compressive forces, is, is significantly higher with a lateralized prosthesis, whereas Nier's design on the left significantly decreases shear forces by eliminating that lever arm. Uh, in addition to decreasing shear forces at the bony implant interface, medializing the glenoid also uh, acts to lengthen the deltoid moment arm and thus the efficiency of the deltoid in shoulder abduction and elevation. You can see that uh, both on the left here, the native shoulder on the top, whereas a reverse TSA has a significantly lengthened deltoid moment arm, same on the right. Uh, and that allows for the deltoid to act more efficiently in initiating shoulder abduction. Uh, uh, additionally, the image on the right further demonstrates how the deltoid moment arm uh, is both lengthened with medialization, but also with lengthening of the humeral component, this helps to tension the deltoid uh, to allow it to uh, work efficiently. That was the final point of his uh, third principle. And so uh, transitioning to his second principle, which really ties into his first, is that the lever arm of the deltoid must be effective from the start of movement, and this is critical. Uh, and that the deltoid must be able to compensate for absent rotator cuff function and really initiate rotation. And so uh, we've already discussed how it does this by medializing the glenoid component and thus lengthening the deltoid arm by between 20 and 42 percent, different biomechanical uh, studies have shown, but also by recruiting anterior and posterior fibers of the deltoid. So you can see on this uh, bottom image, uh, native shoulder on the bottom left, uh, has several fibers of the deltoid that are medial to the center of rotation and therefore unable to act in abduction or flexion. Whereas on the right with medialization of the glenosphere, these zone one and four fibers of the deltoid are now lateral to the center of rotation and able to aid in abduction. Uh, so this is a, another biomechanical study that uh, looked at how reverse shoulder arthroplasty is able to function. And most importantly, I won't get into too much detail, but the, really the important take home point is that analysis of the different deltoid moment arms in reverse shoulder arthroplasty increased deltoid efficiently, efficiency most effective at the start of abduction. So by uh, creating more vertical uh, force vectors at the initiation of abduction, the reverse total shoulder design is able to allow you to initiate abduction without an intact rotator cuff. Uh, briefly, his third and fourth principles. Uh, third, the, process, the prosthesis must be inherently stable. And so this high degree of intrinsic stability frees the reverse total shoulder prosthesis from uh, dependence on active stabilization by concentric compression, which is uh, how your native uh, uh, rotator cuff functions and allows for stable fulcrum for remaining musculature to allow range of motion. And lastly, the glenosphere must be large and the, the humeral cup small to, re, excuse me, to create a semi-constrained articulation. And this allows for a free range of motion without impingement uh, for the reverse TSA to function. And so while Gramit's design was revolutionary and really allowed for the first reverse arthroplasty design to be implemented, there have been several drawbacks from his design. Uh, Many of these have stemmed from the medialization of the glenosphere. There are several other uh, changes that have been made to designs that I won't talk about today. So the angle of the humeral neck, inclination of the base plate, those type of things. Uh, we could have a long discussion on this alone, but I'll avoid those in the essence of time and just talk about primarily medialization of the glenosphere. And this really led to two main issues, which were the loss of internal and external rotation as well as inferior impingement and the phenomenon of scapular notching. So in the same way that medialization of the glenosphere allowed for recruitment of these deltoid fibers for abduction, it also eliminated their potential use for internal and external rotation. Uh, 
to the same image we saw earlier, while the uh, native deltoid does not necessarily function this way, there would be potential for these zone one and four fibers to uh, contribute to internal and external rotation in the absence of an intact cuff, whereas with medialization of the glenosphere, uh, they are unable to do so. Similarly, on the right, you can see how uh, the medialized glenosphere causes impingement of the proximal humeral neck on the scapular neck, and uh, that can lead to both the biomechanical erosion of the bone in the scapular neck, which ultimately leads to polyethylene wear and eventually uh, further erosion uh, beyond the most uh, inferior screw. So uh, there are several options to answer this problem of how do we restore uh, rotation and how do we uh, prevent scapular notching. One that's been around for a long time is latissimus dorsi transfer. Uh, this is just a systematic review from 2017 that included seven studies that essentially showed what uh, we know to be true, which is that lat transfer is successful in restoring external rotation in a shoulder. However, uh, I think I can speak for most shoulder surgeons, uh, at least from what I've seen in the literature, they would much prefer not to perform a lat transfer on every reverse shoulder arthroplasty they do. Uh, it has its own set of complications, adds both time and another level of difficulty to a surgery, and would not be ideal if this was required in, in all surgeries. In addition, this does not address the issues of internal rotation as well as scapular notching. So that's led to really a return to a, a quote, lateralized prosthesis. And so uh, I say lateralized, it's truly a less medialized glenosphere as the center of rotation is still medial to the native uh, anat anatomic center of rotation. Uh, however, improvements uh, in metallosis and the invention of locking screws at the turn of the century has allowed for uh, better uh, base plate designs and better means of fixation. So we've been able to implement different methods of lateralizing the glenosphere in an attempt to fix these problems. These are just a few of the possible options that are on the market today. On the right you see this is a two-thirds hemisphere uh, rather than a half hemisphere to lateralize the glenosphere. This is on the top left there's a optional humeral spacer that uh, can lateralize the humerus in an attempt to uh, tension the, ex the uh, rotate remaining rotator cuff without actually lateralizing the glenosphere. And then the bottom right, this is called a bio or bony inset reverse shoulder arthroplasty that attempts to use a 10 millimeter uh, bony uh, autograph from the humeral head to lateralize the prosthesis. So uh, there have been several studies that have evaluated the benefits of lateralized reverse arthroplasty designs. This is a recent retrospective study that specifically looked at improvement in external rotation in cuff deficient sh shoulders that lacked external rotation prior to surgery. So these are actually shoulders that a significant number of shoulder surgeons would likely perform a lat transfer on as they had uh, CT evidence of at least grade two teres minor fatty infiltration in 70% of their shoulders with 100% grade two or greater infiltration in the infraspinatus. They actually found a significant improvement and external rotation without a lat transfer. So with a lateralized design, these uh, used a two-thirds glenosphere design, they were able to go from a 21 degree external rotation deficit prior to surgery to an average of 27 degrees following surgery. Uh, this is, has been difficult to uh, replicate. This is a, a fairly recent study, but and other studies have not shown this. This is an example of such study that looked at the uh, bio, bony autographed implant to lateralize the center of rotation. They showed that there was a significantly higher active external rotation in the lateralized group if you exclude patients with severe teres minor degeneration. So unlike this, the previous study, this one shows that uh, a lateralized prosthesis is significantly better in improving external rotation if there is an intact rotator cuff uh, that permits external rotation. Again, uh, here's another systematic review that looks at uh, lateralized prosthesis. This looked at both external rotation and functional outcomes as well as scapular notching. And this showed, study really showed that uh, scap rates of scapular notching were significantly uh, improved uh, with lateralized prosthesis. They found that uh, a huge improvement actually at two years of follow-up uh, from 44.9% 
notching, at least grade one notching in traditional medialized prosthesis compared to 5.4% in a lateralized group. I thought this study was significant though in that it does, did show a significant difference in glenoid base plate loosening at only three and a half years on average with an 8.8% uh, incidence in the lateralized group versus 1.8% uh, in the medialized group. In addition, they did show a significant improvement in external rotation as well. And so they concluded that the literature examined in this review suggests that external rotation and lower rates of notching are seen with lateralized prosthesis. However, uh, I think this is something that we're going to have to watch going forward as the entire reason for medializing the glenosphere was to prevent base plate loosening. And they showed a near eight times in increased incidence of base plate loosening at only three and a half years of follow-up with a lateralized design. Uh, moving forward, uh, this is in contrast to other recent studies that have failed to show any in significant improvement in external rotation with lateralized prosthesis. So um, this was a, uh, another study with a minimum of two years of follow-up that also used the bio reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, this was not a industry funded study as most of these other studies have been and they actually found no significant difference uh, between the two groups. So I think going forward, it's going to be important that we have studies that are not industry funded that specifically look at lateralized versus medialized prosthesis and uh, give us uh, outcomes with those studies. So in regards to further regards to scapular notching, uh, several studies have specifically compared notching in medialized and lateralized designs in addition to the ones we've already discussed. Uh, this is a figure from a recent JOS article published on Charleston that uh, just image it, that uh, gives you a couple of representations of the theoretical advantages of a lateralized prosthesis. The one on the left is the traditional uh, grammate design with a bit of exaggerated overlap of the uh, proximal humerus and scapular neck. The middle is a traditional uh, straightforward two-thirds glenosphere lateralized design. And on the right, that is a more hybrid design with a small amount of glenosphere offset, but also humeral offset. And in addition to in a, an attempt to kind of give you a middle of the road uh, tensioning of the external rotators as well as prevention of scapular notching. So uh, before we really evaluate, is it important uh, that we prevent scapular notching? It's important to look at the impact of notching and decide does it really matter? Uh, there have been suggesting, suggestions excuse me, in the early literature that notching is, a sh is not really associated with poor outcomes and uh, that it actually has no impact. Uh, several studies uh, of JBGS in 2009 and 2010 and earlier studies showed no significant differences in functional outcome scores uh, with patients with scapular notching as well as no significant differences in base plate loosening. However, recent literature has started to challenge this. This is one such study that was a retrospective review that looked at nearly 500 patients, mean age of 72 and a half years. All of these were performed using a, a single a reverse shoulder arthroplasty system. They had a very low complication rate compared to other studies looking at reverse shoulder arthroplasty. I think that may reflect that this was from a database that was funded by this prosthesis. Uh, however, they found that patients with scapular notching had significantly lower functional outcome scores, specifically constant ASES scores, compared to those without scapular notching. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, more and more of these studies are showing that there's significant difference in uh, scapular not or excuse me in uh, functional outcome and scapular notching. This is another study that showed that there's a significantly higher incidence of scapular notching in medialized prosthesis versus lateralized. Very similar numbers to that first study that we show uh, that we just looked at, and this makes sense in light of biomechanical studies that have for years shown that. Lateralizing the glenoid component provides a great range of impingement-free uh, range of motion in addition, and therefore limits uh, inferior impingement and scapular notching. And so in summary, uh, uh, there are several new implant designs which aim to lateralize the center of rotation to increase active external rotation and decrease inferior impingement and scapular notching. These studies, however, are limited in that most of them are uh, industry-driven and lack uh, long-term follow-up. 
However, the ones that are there are starting to show mounting evidence that uh, there is decreased uh, functional outcomes with scapular notching. Long and long-term studies are needed to evaluate long-term complication rates, specifically increased rates of base plate le loosening, as we saw in that one large study that showed a near eight-fold increase in scapular, or uh, excuse me, in uh, base plate loosening with scapular notching. So. Uh, Kind of switching gears here, now that we've discussed some of the recent uh, debates regarding prosthesis design, I'd like to talk about how the use of reverse shoulder arthroplasty is increasing uh, through rapidly expanding indications in the United States. Uh, overall, as I mentioned, implant designs are improving with most implants having multiple options uh, for varying amounts of lateralization. Several of those that I showed images of have different uh, implants that can be switched out without any issues and without having to exchange the humeral or uh, glenoid implant. Uh, and these num the number of options continues to increase. Uh, and overall, the use of reverse shoulder arthroplasty continues to expand beyond its approved FDA use for cuff tear arthropathy. So one such indication is in uh, the use of acute proximal humerus fractures. So uh, in the elderly population, proximal humerus fractures represent a significant burden. They're the third most common fracture pattern in patients older than 60 years old. They make up anywhere between six and eight percent of the overall uh, number of fractures in the United States yearly. And treatment options have traditionally consisted of uh, either non-operative management or hemiarthroplasty uh, for comminuted three and four part proximal humerus fractures. So advances in locking plate technology around the same time that the reverse TSA was approved in the United States has led to an increased use in this option in the elderly. However, uh, this has limitations in osteoporotic bone, and uh, for that reason, reverse total shoulder arthroplasty for primary treatment of these three and four part proximal humerus fractures has been increasing over the past 10 to 15 years. So I think the first real question that people begin to ask themselves is, is reverse TSA better than hemiarthroplasty, uh, as this was kind of the standard of treatment uh, from the 1970s really until uh, the early 2000s for comminuted three and four part proximal humerus fractures. So there have been several studies, uh, early studies, as well as some more recent studies that showed no difference between reverse shoulder arthroplasty and hemiarthroplasty. However, I think there's mounting evidence that reverse shoulder arthroplasty is in fact superior to hemiarthroplasty. So this is one actually fairly recent study from uh, JOT in 2015 that uh, was a systematic review that it looked at a total of uh, 30 studies. I think it should be noted how if, with 30 studies they still had less than 250 patients total which speaks to the size of the majority of these studies but they found uh, no significant difference in uh, both functional outcome scores as well as overall range of motion. They did find that reverse shoulder arthroplasties gave approximately 10 degrees uh, more forward flexion, whereas uh, hemiarthroplasties gave a greater amount of external rotation. However, they found a nearly double complication rate in the RTSA group versus hemi hemiarthroplasty group. And for this reason, they actually recommended against reverse TSA uh, for the treatment of proximal humerus fractures. In contrast, there have been multiple other studies and randomized control trials that have found that reverse TSA offers a better option uh, when compared to hemiarthroplasty. This is one such study. This was actually a level two study that looked at 23 consecutive hemis versus 23 consecutive re reverse shoulder arthroplasties. They had good inclusion criteria and specified that this was for comminuted three or four part, four part fractures or that fractures that had an intraarticular head split. And they showed consistent improvement across the board in functional outcome scores. Uh, I think it's worth noting that they had a 100% satisfaction rate in the hemiarthroplasty group in patients that had tuberosity healing, while they had a 100% dissatisfaction rate in the hemiarthroplasty group in patients that did not have tuberosity healing. So this study really uh, highlighted the importance of healing in hemiarthroplasty to overall patient satisfaction, whereas this was not necessarily correlated in the reverse TSA group. This is another uh, study, a level one randomized control trial that randomized pa patients to either hemiarthroplasty or reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And they also showed a significant improvement in both range of motion 
and functional outcome scores with reverse TSA in comparison to hemiarthroplasty. And again, this study reflected the importance of tuberosity healing and patient satisfaction and function. Uh, finally, this is a meta-analysis uh, recently published in JSES that looked at seven studies that reported outcome measures and range of motion in both reverse and hemiarthroplasty. And they found that uh, reverse TSA had significantly uh, higher functional outcome measures as well as range of motion scores when comparison to hemiarthroplasty. This is a summary of their forest plots that just uh, shows uh, those findings. And so with that being said, reverse TSA is a very attractive option for the shoulder surgeon. Uh, it allows them to avoid the high risk of potential catastrophic failure uh, with tuberosity nonunion, resorption, or malunion, which is seen with hemiarthroplasty. And it, therefore gives you more reliable clinical outcomes. So reverse shoulder arthroplasty was originally thought to have acceptable outcomes without tuberosity union or healing, which is still the case. However, more recent data is showing that uh, reverse TSA does have better overall outcomes with tuberosity healing. So this is a study we just looked at at Journal Club. I'll be brief on for that reason, but they found that uh, looking at groups that had tuberosity union, tuberosity non-union, or that had their tuberosities resected, they found overall greater range of motion in patients that had tuberosity union when compared to the other groups. However, it's worth pointing out that the constant scores in this study are still significantly higher than those seen in patients with hemiarthroplasty without tuberosity union. And it's for this reason that shoulder surgeons are starting to turn to reverse TSA over hemiarthroplasty for the use, for the treatment of acute proximal humerus fractures. So uh, this data, reflects that between 2011 and 2014, the use of hemiarthroplasty has been steadily decreasing while the use of reverse total shoulder arthroplasty to treat proximal humerus fractures are steadily increasing. And uh, reverse TSA is now used significantly more often than hemiarthroplasty for the acute treatment of proximal humerus fracture. And I, I really, after talking with Dr. Doty and other surgeons, as well as reading the literature, I think that there's really a, uh, evolving debate that is no longer should we be doing reverse TSA or hemiarthroplasty, but should we be doing uh, reverse shoulders versus ORAF versus non-operative management. And so uh, <clears throat> this is really a very, very challenging question to answer uh, at present due to the recent Im implementation of these interventions, the lack of long-term follow-up for many of these interventions, small cohort sizes for many of these studies, and overall lack of studies that directly compare these treatments. Uh, many studies compare either non-operative management or ORIF using proximal humeral locking plates to hemiarthroplasty as that was the uh, traditional gold standard for combinated three and four parts uh, fractures prior to the 2000s. And it's uh, challenging to answer qu uh, questions based off of studies that compare to hemiarthroplasty. This is one study that actually did compare ORIF with reverse TSA in addition to hemiarthroplasty. They did not report significant differences in uh, functional outcome measures. However, it's worth noting that uh, even though this is a very small cohort study, that all uh, reverse TSA patients were able to achieve forward flexion greater than 90 degrees, whereas less than half in both the hemiarthroplasty and ORIF groups ever achieved greater than 90 degrees of forward flexion. Uh, this is another study that compared uh, reverse TSA to proximal humeral locking plates. This is overall a very poor study, but is one of very few that actually directly compares these two treatments. Uh, they did not specifically report their complication rates and only focused on uh, common complications. However, they did find that reverse TSA in patients with comminuted three and port four part proximal humerus fractures had significantly better functional outcomes following reverse shoulder arthroplasty compared to proximal humeral locking plate fixation. Uh, another study uh, that was uh, systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at seven randomized control studies in addition to 15 observational studies found no significant difference and on functional outcome between operative not, and non-operative management overall. They actually had 80% uh, of the operative groups were using a proximal humerus locking plate and the rest were with hemiarthroplasty. So this study actually, actually recommended non-operative treatment for patients greater than 65 years old. The issue with uh, studies like this is 
uh, if you really break down the randomized control trials or the observational studies, many of them exclude patients that have, quote, uh, obvious operative uh, indications. They don't typically explain those or expand on those. They just say, oh, we had X number of patients that uh, were excluded because they had either had shoulder fracture dislocation or obvious indications. And I think that greatly skews the data in these studies that look at fixation versus no fixation. Um, uh, this is another study uh, that had s similar findings out of Europe. This is, was actually published in JAMA 2015. This is a highly quoted study in Europe as they're uh, urging for non-operative management in certain countries. Uh, and again, this study recommended no, or found no significant difference in operative versus non-operative management. However, they had 100 patients that were disqualified because they had an associated dislocation, and another 87 were uh, had clear indications for surgery, which were not expanded upon. They were just not included for those reasons. Uh, again, another study, retrospective review. This is actually the most recent. Uh, and really one of the only direct comparisons between non-operative management and reverse TSA. This is out of Stedman Hawkins in Greenville. They found no significant difference between shoulder arthroplasty and non-operative management in regards to functional outcomes. However, this was a retrospective review that did not randomize patients. And uh, for that reason, I think it's, it's difficult to draw hard indications as far as whether you should be treating these non-operatively or the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, so the question then is, if people do this well without surgery, why are we treating them? And why, why has the overall incidence of uh, both ORIF and arthroplasty been increasing for proximal humerus fractures over the past de decade? And I think the answer is that uh, it's found in studies such as this one that found significantly improved quality of life due to significant differences in pain. I think many surgeons are starting to see that patients with proximal humerus fractures often do very poorly in early function and pain and uh, have been choosing to operate more and more frequently for those reasons. So in summary, a reverse TSA, uh, despite different studies that have shown no significant improvement over non-operative management, it has been found to be a viable option for both acute and revision proximal humerus fractures with overall good uh, outcomes. Reverse TSA has surpassed hemiarthroplasty as the arthroplasty of choice for proximal humerus fractures and for the majority of surgeons. Uh, we still have no definitive answers uh, in regards to the question of do we fix these with proximal humerus locking plates, arthroplasty, or non-operative management, but it's very clear that the best treatment is likely highly individualized based on overall osteoporotic features as well as uh, pre-injury function in different patients. There is a strong need for other level one studies that look at reverse TSA versus ORIF non-operative management. There is actually one such study that is uh, being conducted in Norway right now that is a randomized control trial looking at proximal humerus locking plates versus reverse TSA uh, and comminuted three and poor part, part fractures, and that should be published later this year, and I think will uh, significantly contribute to the literature in regards to how we should be fixing these. So transitioning now, uh, in addition to treatment for proximal humerus fractures, uh, many reverse total shoulder arthroplasties are now being uh, performed for massive rotator cuff tear in the absence of uh, shoulder arthritis. So uh, cuff tear arthropathy, which is defined as significant pain and pseudoparalysis in the presence of shoulder arthritis is the initial and only uh, FDA approved uh, indication for reverse TSA, however, uh, surgeons have found that you are able to restore shoulder function in patients with irreparable massive rotator cuffs, uh, even in the absence of uh, arthritis, and that in older patients, they're able to get overall good increases in function and range of motion, uh, even though they do not have significant radiographic findings uh, that would suggest cuff tear arthropathy. Uh, part of the reason that reverse TSA is being implemented for these is that there are not really any great options for irreparable rotator cuff. Uh, this is a summary slide or a table from a recent review article that uh, looked at different options for irreparable rotator cuffs. And I've just highlighted here on the right the radiologic failure rates of these SCR, uh, subacromial spacers, 
partial attempted partial repair, biological augmentations are all uh, significant and greater than 20% with the majority of them approaching 50%. I know this is a very hot topic in the sports medicine community and these are coming out more and more with more and more options, uh, but nevertheless, they have high failure weight rates and uh, often lead to multiple surgeries. Uh, so this is one study that was a systematic review that included six studies, minimum of two years of follow-up to look at uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty for massive rotator cuff tear. They did have a significant revision rate, uh, just under 10%, but they concluded that <coughs> reverse shoulder arthroplasty gives uh, good relief of pain, restoration of function, and is similar to reverse TSA performed for cuff tear arthropathy in older patients. This is another. Uh, recent systematic review that found similar findings and concluded that reverse shoulder arthroplasty is a safe and effective option for patients with massive irreparable rotator cuffs. Uh, it is important to note that there's a significant complication rate, 17.4%, uh, which is relatively consistent with other studies and that it is very important that this be discussed with patients prior to undergoing reverse shoulder arthroplasty for a cuff tear. Uh, there have been several studies out of Europe that have looked at long-term outcomes for reverse TSA for uh, cuff tear in the absence of shoulder arthropathy. This is one that uh, looked at 15-year results. So it's important that we realize this is using uh, first-generation Delta III prosthesis and that more modern techniques and prosthetics are much more advanced than this. Uh, I think that speaks to the, the significant complication rate found in this study. Uh, they actually had six failures out of 22 total shoulders that had to be converted to either hemiarthroplasty or cement spacer due to either infection or fracture. However, the patients that did not go on to failure did fairly well at 15 years uh, with 82% either excellent or good uh, outcomes after 15 years of follow-up. This is another study that uh, included the previous 15-year uh, follow-up. It was a systematic review that looked at uh, eight studies with at least five years of follow-up, and this was kind of a groundbreaking study in that they showed that the patients not only did well, but none of their clinical scores or, or active ranges of, range of motion significantly deteriorated uh, with up to 20 years of follow-up. So this is really applicable to our next conversation, which will, or my next topic, which will be uh, repair of uh, cuff tear arthropathy or uh, massive rotator cuff tears in patients younger than 65, and that early studies showed a significant decrease in shoulder function ab abduction over uh, five to 10 years. However, this was one of the first studies that showed no significant uh, decrease. And so this is just a summary of that. This is a busy slide, but you can see down at the bottom that then the greater than 10 year cohort amongst these five studies with at least five years of follow-up, they still had greater than 115 degrees of uh, shoulder abduction in all but one study. And so in summary, uh, reverse TSA offers a good solution to improve function and range of motion for patients with massive cuff tear in the absence of arthritis. Patients show consistent improvement in function uh, and overall satisfaction when compared to that seen in patients treated uh, with cuff tear arthropathy. And it is imperative that the high complication rates be discussed with patients prior to surgery as uh, there are other options out there, although those, those do have high failure rates as well. So that leads us to uh, leads me to my last indication that I'll discuss this morning, which is reverse TSA for patients less than 65. Uh, this is also a very hot topic uh, in that the FDA has officially approved reverse TSA for patients 65 years and older. However, many patients have been found to benefit from uh, arthroplasty at a younger age. Uh, this was originally um, recommended against for several reasons. In the early 90s, there were many studies that showed significantly decreased shoulder function and abduction re with reverse TSA after uh, five to 10 years. This was further uh, confirmed or uh, supported by studies in JBGS in 2006 and another study in 2011 that showed significant functional deterioration between five and 10 years. However, as shown in that last study, there are many studies now that are showing that uh, this is not the case. This is another such study that uh, looked at patients with between five and 15 years of follow-up. This is through the same physicians that performed that previous study. They looked at a total of 40 reverse TSAs 
performed with a, a first generation prosthesis. They showed again a high complication rate with a high rate of failure, up to 15%. However, in patients that did not go on to failure, there was no significant deterioration of shoulder range of motion or function at 10 years. And another important point is that previous surgery did not have a significant impact on complication rates. And this is uh, significant in that many of these patients for being treated at younger ages as well as for massive rotator cuff tear undergo a previous surgery prior to reverse TSA. And many studies have shown higher complication rates with revision surgery. Uh, this is just a summary of their data and showing that at seven to 10 years, there's still uh, significantly uh, good relative constant scores, uh, even better than uh, at younger ages and that their active forward and forward flexion and abduction are maintained. Uh, so this is another retrospective review that shows similar findings with uh, lower complication rates. It looked at 63 patients and they, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, showed, looked at 63 patients with a minimum of two years follow-up, had a good survival rate, and they showed significant improvements in overall shoulder function scores, pain, and range of motion consistent with uh, previous studies. So uh, finally, this is another study out of JBJS in 2017 that, again, showed clinical outcomes did not significantly deteriorate beyond 10 years and that functional results of patients with previous surgical procedures were not significantly inferior to the results of those with primary reverse TSA. So uh, these are their findings uh, summarized in a table. Uh, I think these studies that are showing good long-term outcomes are critical uh, for application of reverse TSA in young patients in that if we're going to be in, implanting these in patients between 55 and 65 years old, uh, many of them have high expectations and higher demands and uh, require anywhere for at least 10 to 20 years of successful outcomes for them to uh, be happy with their uh, surgery. So in summary, uh, as I mentioned, reverse TSA provides good short-term and mid-term results restoring function and relieving pain in young patients, but more and more evidence is showing that long-term results uh, are promising and that early rep reports of long-term outcomes show satisfactory results in reverse TSA in younger patients. However, appropriate patient selection is critical, uh, as well as clear explanation of potential complications. Uh, this uh, study here, that showed good functional outcome scores at 10 to 18 years, also found a 25% dissatisfaction rate amongst younger patients at that follow-up. And I think this uh, uh, reflects the higher expectations of younger patients and that they expect to have better outcomes overall. So where has this left us in the United States in regards to the use of reverse TSA? Well, as I mentioned, reverse TSA has only been approved for 15 years in the United States. However, as of 2011, uh, it represented one-third of all shoulder arthroplasties performed, and the overall number of arthroplasties uh, has continued to grow in addition to the, the use of reverse TSA. And uh, reverse TSA has now surpassed anatomic total shoulder as the most frequently used arthroplasty in shoulders in the United States, and this is only continuing to grow. So in conclusion, uh, I've covered several topics this morning. Thanks for sticking with me. The use of reverse TSA is rapidly expanding in the United States. Uh, indications for reverse TSA are expanding in both the U.S. as well as Europe, and patients continue to do well. While early reports of infection rates of up to 5% have significantly decreased uh, from original reports, overall complication rates continue to be significantly higher than that in other arthroplasty designs. And it is important, imperative that this is discussed with patients prior to undergoing reverse TSA. And many new arthroplasty designs offer potential improvement in function and complication rates, but level one and long-term studies are needed going forward to further confirm that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, so. 
That's that's right. And so, yes, sir. So I chose not to. I feel like I could have had a talk on just that alone. Um, so things, especially with regards to scapular not, notching, uh, humeral neck shaft angle, most of the new modern prosthesis utilize either 135 or 145 degrees, whereas the original prosthesis were 155 degrees. Base plate inclination as well. So most modern prosthesis either have or aim for 10 degrees of inferior tilt, although whether that ha impacts notching or not is, has been debated, but it's shown for sure that superior tilt does impact notching, and so uh, certain designs aim to prevent that, as well as uh, the other things you mentioned. Um, how, I, I, as I said, I think I could have talk, talked all day about that. Yes, sir. I would caution us all to just look at the literature and see retrospective studies that look at lateralized versus medialized that don't break out the different variations uh, to think about the type of limitation of pathology. You probably ought to be able to do all of those different options if you're going to do it versus pick and choose for different practice patterns or different patient anatomy or different patient preferences. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that, I tried to kind of give a broad overview of that, but um, there's certainly limitations. Most of these studies are funded either, if you look at the disclaimers, either funded by one of the companies or the surgeons are connected to one of the companies. I think that the prosthesis designs are trying to start to give more options within their own designs and giving exchangeable offsets and uh, potential options for humeral offset with a medialized glenosphere or uh, hybrid lateralization in the gl glenosphere uh, as well as different options for base inferior base plate placement but those it's hard to, to bear that out in the literature for all those reasons and that the the studies are are small cohorts they're industry driven and they all don't just look at a lateralized prosthesis. There's all these other factors that have been shown in biomechanical studies to also impact uh, scapular notching and range of motion. Yes, sir. So uh, I think with, in regards to fracture, the, the ideal patient is someone who's osteoporotic, uh, older, so typically older than 70 years old, but still had high pre-injury levels of function. So people who are still uh, desire, still doing things that require high range of motion and uh, overall function and that understand the complications and still desire to, uh, are, are willing to risk those complications to restore their function. So I would, I would not be doing this in the patients who uh, have low daily demands or in patients who have good bone stock and are, are not osteoporotic and could, could undergo ORIF with the proximal humerus locking plate.
So part of that is if you break down the complication rates and look at what exactly is uh, is is are the complication rates much of it is scapular notching, which still is is not being is not fully borne out as far as how much of an impact that has on function. There's been significant correlation with decreased function, but not a significant uh, correlation to base plate loosening. So how important is that complication? We're not sure. The, and the alternatives also have high complications as well. So the uh, proximal humeral locking plate studies show screw cutout rates of up to 12% or 13%. And uh, the revision, comp the, the rates of revision surgery following ORIF are significantly higher for both reverse shoulder arthroplasty or other uh, surgeries as well. And so it's really uh, kind of the reason you would be doing this is patients are hurting, they're getting poor outcomes with other surgeries as well, and it's kind of, it's really an option that says, hey, if you really want a high level of function, the highest level of function attainable in certain patients, it gives you that option.